Welcome to another impactful episode with me, Amit Khanna, your host. I have my lovely guest today, Zoe Prago. Hi, Zoe. Welcome to Communicate with Impact. How are you doing today? Hello. Uh, nice to see you, Amit. Thank you very much for having me over. I'm in Athens, Greece, and I was actually looking forward to do this. Fantastic. So here you go, people. Athens, Greece. You know, we heard that place in one of the best travel places. And now there are people from that place to help you grow in your career. Now, before I give uh, back to Zoe for a detailed introduction, I'll just mention that she's an organizational psychologist empowering mental health and equality in workplace through leadership development and cultural transformation. There's a lot that you need to know about Zoe. I'm going to share the links as well. However, let me pass the mic to her for a good introduction. Well, like you've already mentioned, I'm an organizational psychologist and a business coach. Therefore, what I'm actually doing is that I work with corporations all over the world. My specialty is culture change projects. And then I do everything that has to do with employee training, crisis management, uh, sensitivity training for minority rights in the workspace or sexism in the workspace. And at the same time, I also have my future clients that are also global and they usually come to me for soft skills training, leadership development, or you know, sometimes they might need some help to move on with their next step of their career or they're not sure what that should be. So pretty much that's how I'm spending most of my time. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Zui, could you tell me what exactly cultural culture means to you when it comes to workplace? Because it's like a buzzword and I just want to understand what exactly culture means. From your side. Well, I would say in a simple sense, it's the way we're doing things around here, but it's so much more than that. It's the way we look, it's the way our offices are, our dress code, the traditions we might be having, uh, the things we believe to be true about our company, our ideas, our values. But at the same time, all the things that we don't necessarily advertise, we don't necessarily uh, say or speak about, but they're the ones creating this whole vibe and the climate for work. For example, if everyone is gossiping a lot, no one will tell you about it if you ask them about the company. But at the end, if everyone is doing it, then maybe that's part of the culture as well, because that's what's forming the processes and what's uh, at the end is going to make sure that person is a culture fit or it's not a culture fit. So I would say, to put it simply, culture is the glue that sticks together every single person inside an organization, but not just person, also every single process, every single tradition, every si single thing that makes organization what it is. Wow, wow. That's, that's interesting. Is it safe to say that, you know, now specifically post COVID, you know, that one organization, uh, you know, you, you don't just work in that physical organization, right? Now you have digital people across the globe, right? So how important it is for somebody to understand the culture of the parent company that they're working for? Well, it depends on the company. There have been companies for startups that have been remote companies uh, even before COVID, especially in the tech business. This is very common that some, uh, because these kind of companies usually they're very talent oriented. Therefore, they're searching talent and they don't put any physical limitation as to where this talent is going to be based. Therefore, I think that it has to do a lot with experience. Companies that have been doing it longer, it's easier for them to create onboarding processes and the recruitment processes that are based on culture fit and uh, team building activities so that they create a sense of culture. But at the same time, companies that have just recently been digitally transformed, they have an issue with scaling towards that direction. Oh, oh yeah, true. I think companies, yeah, I, and I, I completely understand the offshore, onshore model or onshore, offshore model is there for a, quite a long time. And I think they're doing better. Mainly around negotiation and how you need to handle that. Could you, could you share some insights on that article? Yeah, well, actually, this is one of the things I wish somebody told me when I was younger and I didn't have to find out on my own the hard way. But every single transaction in this life, basically, it's a negotiation. And every time you're not negotiating, what you're doing is that you just take whatever other people are giving you without questioning if that's enough or if that's worthy or if that's what you wanted in the first place. Therefore, negotiation is an active part of our lives anyway. The question is, are we doing it correctly? And are we doing it in a way that's also profitable for us in order for us to get where we want to be? Pretty much also that's what the article is about. And uh, I try through this article to take away the stigma, stigma around the negotiation, because usually in our minds, we have a representation that every time a person is negotiating, uh, they're also unethical or uh, they have a hidden agenda. And it's not about that. It's basically about being assertive, putting your thoughts in the right order and just not taking the first thing they give you and be able to push back in order to reach a common ground when both you and the other side are equally happy. You know, actually, it's a very interesting thing because you just mentioned first that we are trained to just accept things the way they are or the way they are presented to 
<coughs> and people do not see that they can negotiate and i completely agree whenever you use this word negotiate you know people actually feel that either i'm going to either someone has a motive behind it or i'm going to lose out of something you know mm-hmm. so it's it's very interesting to understand that you know negotiation is something that you know you you can be you can get better and uh, you don't have to just stick with what's been given to you exactly and not only that but it's also something uh, interesting that it should also be guilt relieving you don't have to be feeling guilt just because you're not happy with what they're giving you and just because you want more or because you want something different you have every right to want whatever you want as long as you put up the work and put up the efforts to get there wow wow uh yeah i i i understand this you know i it's quite tricky when people get into this sort of a discussion because a lot of people actually you're not absolutely right in a way that a lot of people do feel a certain level of guilt when it comes to asking it okay but just just for the thought process okay i just want to think on this why do you think that happens with many what are your thoughts like why do people go into that guilt mode at all on the first place I think it's very much uh, it has to do a lot with culture and it also has to do a lot uh, with religion. We are raised with feeling guilt and feeling that we might be egocentric or uh, it is might be selfish that you want more or you want something uh-huh. different and we are raised with the belief that it's a sin to be selfish it's a sin. Therefore self care it's not really something that we're being taught to do. It's not something we are trained to do. It's something we are trained to feel that it's bad and wrong and other people's interests should be more important than our own interests. Wow. Wow yeah. I never thought it in this way but you're absolutely right we are taught to not be selfish and if you relate that directly to the self care itself yeah a lot of people actually don't even take care of themselves right in the first place uh, uh, with respect to what they've done and uh, you know what they deserve and sometimes even their health yeah i, I never I saw a movie that. i saw a movie some years ago and it had an amazing quote it just stuck with me you know and uh, there was this uh, guy and they were having conversation and they said the one said good things come to those who wait and the other one said yeah but only the things left behind but the ones that they were, that were running and yeah, that was amazing for me because he just yeah exactly so on the one I'm sure if you wait you're going to get something but at the same time only the left overs because some other people were waiting some other people they knew what they wanted and they were assertive about it and they were running to get it so let's just hope that you don't want the the, the first class and the, the top shelf of the projects out there That's that's an interesting analogy and I think it it would be really interesting for the viewers to listen to this thought process as well because yeah we we always hear that you know we be patient wait and I understand that you know and that that's exactly what happens you know many people actually complain that hey you know I don't get the raise that I deserve probably they never asked for it or they never emphasized on it you know or they never negotiated like you said you know they never thought of it so this this I'm going to tell you yes I'm going to tell you a small story here. I had a coaching client. She was amazing at what uh, she was doing. Uh, she was a lead graphic designer in a top global company. And uh, every year, when the time of the evaluation and the races were coming, this company, uh, they were having a system where you had to also evaluate yourself. And if you put yourself anything more than three out of five or under three out of five, you had to explain it. So my client is an introvert and she was getting so much stress around that topic. Therefore, she always put herself three. never more never although she was amazing she was like killing it in the job but she didn't want to put herself in the position of having to explain or having to uh, you know maybe have a conflict or a confrontation so we started working together and the evaluation period came and i said what is this like and of course you, you should know she left for the end of the session to tell me that by the way i also feel busy for tomorrow i said okay we have time i want to say over it show me and i was like why did you put three in everything like you're doing everything right i said yeah but what did they tell me that's not You you should know what you're doing and we've been working together anyway I put a lot of pressure so she changed it to fours and fives everyone and she was ready to answer every question and then she went there and uh, her boss her manager actually said finally you stand up for yourself and we really appreciate it that uh, you finally you know have the courage to come here and support your job and defend your job and this was the first time in the 6 years she was there that she got a promotion and a raise wow wow just just i mean she could have got it early just that she yeah 
I can imagine. And how this how changed many here. Like, I can't explain yeah. to you how this experience changed here. And now uh, I'm not coaching her anymore because she doesn't need any coaching anymore. But she texts me her news every now and then. And she, she has changed three, four jobs since then. Wow. Uh, she has doubled her income since then. And she's sending me this message. She's so happy to interview this company. I killed the first, <laughs> which is amazing <laughs> for me. I love that. Absolutely. I love it. Absolutely, you would. You you are the one who actually got her to that place. Oh no, she got it. She one hundred percent got herself there. I didn't do anything. I was just there, uh, the crazy person on the other side of the Zoom, pushing her to to change the three and you know, <laughs> just go and get what she deserves. Wow, wow. No, I I think I think it's it's quite relevant what you're saying is that a lot of people because of the con- confrontation, like you said, you know, they don't. Uh, put it across, and uh, yeah, a typical person who has a good output in their day. You know, what do you feel? How do they plan, or what are your suggestions to plan the day to get a maximum output? Well, actually, I'd say that this is a very personal process, and what might be working for a person might not be working for another person. In general, I can tell you that for me, I totally function more in the morning. Although it's harder for me to concentrate in the morning, but then the moment it starts getting darker outside, then the less tired I get, and the less. So I just need to be disciplined enough to start my day in the morning. And then there are people that will tell you start with you know the hardest thing on your plate, and then there are others that will tell you start with the things that make you more stressed or something funny. For me, what actually I've seen working not only for me but also for my clients is smaller rewards. Take breaks. Uh, reward yourself for doing something. Like do something that you like. Don't feel guilty about taking the break or for putting your amazing tea and taking some time to drink your tea before you move on with tasks. And then at the same time, I believe that it's about time we start separating the process of doing the job with the process of uh, gaining pleasure of the job. We just need to start understanding that some jobs need to be done, some tasks need to be done, and not all of the tasks will be fulfilling. As long as the end goal is fulfilling, then this should be enough for motivation. And the more we try to, wow. we try to train ourselves into finding motivation in every single thing that we're doing, then this is just a bad dopamine uh, training for our brains because we can never do that. Of course, there are tasks that are wasted. Like I love my job, but when I have to prepare an offer for a big corporate project and I know it's going to take me four hours, I hate it. So I don't do it. And I think, okay, I have to find the pleasure there. No, I will never find the pleasure. They say, okay, I need to do it. And then when I'm finished doing it, I can go and have a tea and read my book. And let's sit down and do it. So at this point, yeah. we need to stop searching for external motivation and start searching a little bit more for internal discipline. At the end of the day, it's all about that. And the more you're getting used to it, then the more you'll be starting feeling motivated and good about yourself for managing to be productive on something that you didn't want to do in the first place. Wow. Uh, I actually never thought in this sense, okay, honestly, uh, is that you will, uh, like it's not about motivation on every task that you do. I completely agree. And you're not going to fulfill, like it's not going to be like, oh, wow, it's so wonderful and all that. So, and I completely understand this now is that not everything is going to make you happy in a way uh, or it's going to be fulfilling, but you still have to do it, period. Like, you know, whether you be exactly. happy or you don't. I think the preference is that do it. Over a period of time, you might get used to the end result, which will eventually make you happy to do this now. Right? Yeah, right? That's, that's, a, that's a trap. Exactly. That's a trap that uh, creates a context for us where it's basically impossible to uh, achieve any long term big goal. Because they say, I'm learning French. Okay. Obviously, I don't like learning French per se. I don't enjoy that I have three hours per week and I have to study and no. But I do like speaking French when I'm in French. So if I had to gain any uh, motivation from the daily task, I would never. And that would probably lead me to, at one point, abandon French because it might take five, six or seven years before I'm able to speak at the level that I want to be speaking. Therefore, the more we try to combine these two things together, the process with the end goal and being motivated and being happy about it, then the, the more difficult we make it for ourselves to set ambitious goals. Because most of the ambitious goals, they require strategy, they require planning and they require time. And this time, you need to have particular steps. And not every of these steps is going to be graceful and fun and enjoyable. True, true. No, absolutely. I'm not going to say anything more. I think you've broken down the whole goal seeking and what happens. No, that, that that's really nice. I think, uh, yeah, I think the viewers are going to look it into a different perspective now at least. Uh, because I, I think what that's what happens when people said that how do you plan? Most of the folks actually land up cursing their work and you know not getting happy and at the end of the day they just keep doing things that are not required, taking unnecessary breaks sometimes and feeling demotivated at the end. So yeah, I think 
your answer would now yeah, end. Yeah, because it's, it's a trap. It's a vicious cycle. When you're searching happiness from every single activity you're doing, you will never get it. And that's why that will be making you more sad and more miserable. It's like gym. There's no way you're going to get abs the first time you go to the gym. You have to go and go and go and go and go. Even if you don't enjoy the process and even if you're not giving it every day your 100%. Even just showing up and doing some treadmill is better than not going and staying at home. And eventually, you're going to start seeing the results. And then you're going to be feeling very good with the results. So the things that in this life bring us the most pleasure and the biggest motivation at the end are the ones that took the longest to get there as well. Yeah, it's like the same thing with the food, right? You eat broccoli, which you don't like it, but it's going to be good for you <laughs> for the longer yeah. run. <laughs> Pretty much, Cakes yeah. Will not help. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Uh, office politics, right? Now, office politics comes in many forms, right? So, I want to know from your end, how do you define office politics or what you've seen over a period of time and how do you handle it or manage it or go with it? Well, I'm a culture nerd. So, what I'm going to tell you is that trying to create a recruitment process so solid and have a culture so strong and unified that you don't need office politics because everyone is on the same page to begin with. What I don't like is corporations that just try to create structure and process and structure and process in order to push people fit into boxes that they just can't fit. Therefore, you need to be accountable. Maybe you haven't done the correct uh, choice of people or maybe you need to change your culture or maybe you need to change, for sure you need to change something. Otherwise, it's not sustainable. Of course, when it comes to office politics, I understand that since we are all children of our time, uh, when it comes to diversity, when it comes to minority rights, still there are generations that are not there yet. So it would be nice to remind them about respect, to remind them about sensitivity and about empathy. But if you end up spending your entire HR department's time on creating more policies, then you're not doing something right when you're choosing people. Or your culture mm -hmm. is not what you want it to be or what you think it be. That might also be the case. Like if you say you prioritize, I don't know, talent, and then you need 100 KPIs and 100 office policies to promote talent and maybe not everyone is on the same page you know mm. so basically start right when you actually recruit to make sure that you have the things placed there like you know when you recruit actually, your one culture step before yeah one step before make sure that you know your culture so that you can recruit according to ah. your culture Got it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you need to know your culture, put that into the recruitment and make sure that you get the people that fits in, in a way. Okay. Mm -hmm. exactly. And that will definitely reduce it. It will not eliminate it, but it will definitely reduce it because now at least people are on the same page, you know, in the organization. Well, like, I mean, I get it. it. You need to have some office politics in the sense that about how we operate or maybe uh, dress code, or maybe some simple stuff. But if you end up having a book of uh, 150 office politics, then you're not doing something right. And no one is going to remember them anyway. So who are you trying to pull there? Just do the change that you need to change. And at one point, we need to understand that change brings confusion and change brings some intensity. But you can't make an, an omelette without breaking some eggs. It's okay. <laughs> That's, yeah. <laughs> That's a nice analogy. Again, fantastic. I, I completely agree. I think, yeah. Uh, make sure to break the eggs to get the omelette. I think that people would understand that. And it will remember. Fantastic. Fantastic. Emotions, yeah. So the next question is about emotion. You know, a lot of people, and I'm talking about those folks who are getting into a leadership role, who are now going to handle a team. They always worked within themselves and stuff, right? Uh, as an individual, most of the time, but now they have to handle other people or you know work with them very closely. So one of the questions that people have is that, uh, on a, how do we handle emotions specifically when there are escalations? You know. Uh, when there is tension in the room, how do you handle emotions? What are your thoughts? Well, for starters, I need to challenge you on that because I don't think that uh, a great tension happens just out of nowhere. Usually what does happen is that there are small, small tensions that accumulate. Therefore, my advice here would be don't let it accumulate. Deal with each of each, of each tension separately the first time they appear. Even if it makes you feel stressed at the moment, if you don't like, uh, you know, conflict and you hate having confrontations, when you deal with a small conflict, the moment it appears, you have all the control in the world and all the power to manage this conflict the way it should be managed. But when you let it accumulate, there's no way you're not going to lose it, lose your temper, or maybe the other side will lose your temper. So for sure, the more you let it accumulate and become bigger, the less power you're losing to managing it and solving it. Yeah, I mean, if you want a small example, let's think just a small example, okay? Let's say yeah. that I don't like when people are touching my things. So I have this colleague, first day they show up in my office and while they speak on the phone, they take my pencil. 
I gotta look at it and I say, hmm, okay, yeah, I hate it, but it just depends. And then maybe we didn't even mean it and whatever. And then I say nothing. The next day, this person comes and uh, they start uh, picking my stress ball. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that makes it stress, but it's just stressful. Probably they don't even understand that I don't like it. Or even worse, I'm gonna show it. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna say anything, but I'm gonna be very passive aggressive about it and they should understand that something's wrong. Uh, spoiler alert, they never do. And then, let's say next day, this particular person comes and while I'm there, they drink from my water. And then I lose it. I just snap and I start screaming at them. And they're like, would you touch my snap? Now, it's important to understand that nine out of 10, this person has no idea what we're talking about. In our mind, it accumulated. In our mind, first you got my pen and then you got my stress ball and now you have your dusty drink from my water. But for this person, these are three completely irrelevant events and most probably they don't even remember them. Therefore, we look like a crazy person at the moment. And most probably mm. we actually are. If yeah. we had, if we had discussed the conflict first time it appeared, which is when they took the pencil, we turn around and say, "Listen, bro, uh, you can have it now." But I really, really, it makes me very uncomfortable when people touch my stuff. Is that okay with you? And then at that point, again, if the person is not a completely psychopath, they they would respect our boundaries. Okay, since we said them very clear, very verbally. And then if they don't, then we have every right to snap at them next time. Yeah. It's a completely yeah. different situation. What we don't have the right to do is expect people to read our needs for us. True, true, absolutely. No, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it's it's not about to going to the point of escalation, uh, waiting for it. It's rather than so handling emotions right in the beginning when they are in a very, very dormant stage or still not very vulnerable. I think that's better way to handle it rather than just going and blasting someone or yes. to the point waiting to blast someone. That's that's actually your point. Uh, I think when we started off, we spoke about negotiation, right? And you did share about your uh, one of your clients. She had the problem from moving from three, and I think it's the same thing that if you are willing to, uh, you know, people fear most of the time to confront, and that's why they will keep building the emotion and uh, you know make a mess later. But if you just do it earlier, it works here as well. Hey, moving on, uh, the next question is about uh, you know challenging difficult stakeholders, right? There are some times you know you. See, I've seen over the last couple of decades that I've been working, there are a couple of types of people that I interact with. One is that they are just plain difficult. You know, they sometimes just don't want to agree onto anything that you say or they don't like it. They might have a reason, but we just don't know it. The question is that how do you handle them, right? How do you work with difficult mm -hmm. stakeholders who are not willing to work with you? They don't like it or they don't like you. Because the thing is that when someone is all the time difficult about something, usually it has nothing to do about that something. And it has very much something to do with the other person across the room in the negotiation table. So you should be focused always on your own agenda and your own benefit and your own interest. What do you want from this negotiation? Let's say that you want that they agree on something. Then if they're constantly disagreeing, you, sh you should start understanding that mo most probably it doesn't have to do with that something. If you have offered endless things and they've always been disagreeing, it has to do with you. Therefore, you need to change your negotiation style in order to get what you want. Most people don't get that. They see someone who gets like a very tough or very strict and they just try to jump on them as if uh, there is a wall and instead of trying a way to pass around the wall or create a bridge or go under the wall or just go out of the door and do the cycle, I'm just hitting my head on the wall. This doesn't work. Therefore, if you are focused on what you want to achieve, then it's going to be very easy for you to pivot with your strategies and become sweeter or more delicate or let something slide or ignore passive aggressive comments or even ignore aggressive comments because why does it matter you're there to do a job and you're there to get something so focus on what you want to get and figure out a way to get it that's that's quite interesting how do you my i would just follow up follow up question that you know most of the time you know people don't people aren't able to focus on what they want and do it because they feel this person as a threat and especially if it's an employee and if it's, it's this person is a little senior to them so what what would you advise to that employee in this case because it's quite challenging because he or she feels that you know they're not they won't be able to grow if they don't have this uh, you know bond between each other well if your boss your manager your line manager is someone who's very passive aggressive and puts you in this uh, situation, most probably you're not going to grow in this environment anyway. Therefore, you should just try to learn what there is there to learn, pick up the more knowledge or the experience or whatever you need to get from this environment and then shift the environment. Just move on. 
And don't take yeah. everything personally. If you, it's not the environment where you see yourself growing and thriving, then you shouldn't be taking it very personally as well. If you have already understood that I'm not a cancer fit here, or this is not the organization for me, then you can't be seeking constantly approval from people that they don't have this approval to give you. That's, that's, that's valid. I, I, I agree. Because many times I, I tell people that, you know, to move out. But now I think your explanation of not being culturally fit and it's not working out learn don't take it personally and probably move on no, i think that that's a that's a fair point uh, as well i think it's a very easy question that we should be asking in every interaction that we're not sure how to act is what do i want to gain from this interaction where is my mm. interest based right now and the moment you answer you reposition yourself into what you should be focusing on and then you should be taking it from there when someone insults, insults us, we have three choices. One is to insult them back. A second choice is to escalate. And the third choice is to not care about it and focus on what we, here, we came here to do. Therefore, go back to what your interest is and ignore every kind of distraction, even if the distraction is personal. Nice. Nice. Yeah, got it. Go with what we want. First, people need to know what exactly they're there for. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a trap, Amit. That's a trap. Do you really know what you want? Or you also sat on the negotiation table without knowing what you really want from this interaction? That's the number one. <laughs> Never, ever, ever go to an interaction without being sure about where your interest is based. Hmm. That's interesting. Well, I'm going to listen to the recording again <laughs> just to make sure that I don't want to this trap. I'm but crazy. Thanks, thanks, for <laughs> thanks for this because I, I think it's very, very interesting discussion here. Uh, and a lot of people are going to benefit on this thought process. Uh, just for the viewers, you know, I'm going to cut out these small clips and I'm going to post it out as well because this this needs to be discussed. This needs to be actually understood by many. Okay. That are you just there uh, without negotiations to be even begin with? Do you know why you're there? What do you want? And uh, you know, probably you're in a trap. KPI of communication. You know, so I, I've been working with folks. People have put across a lot of questions that I just thought, how would you judge communication, right? Because there's no level. And I'll tell you the reason where I'm coming from. And this is for viewers as well. Like for years and years and years, I always used to get three, whenever I used, even if I get five out of five in my ratings, you know, I did the best. But my manager used to say that in improvement, put communication as a word. Why? Because you just, you're not a master of it yet. And I understand because I don't know. So my question is, what is the master level? What is the KPI for communication? That's something like key performance indicators that we can say that, all right, you're a good communicator and sort of benchmarking it if I want to. Okay. Well, uh, I can't speak for everyone, but I can tell you what works for me and what I apply to my clients as uh, it's working. Not only when it comes to communication, but in every sort of soft skill, I only trust 360 feedback service. Therefore, if I want to see how you're doing the communication, what I would do is I would give you a survey on communication and then exactly the same survey I would give to all of your subordinates in your department or your colleagues or your manager to fill. And then I would compare the results. Like, okay, why Amit tells me that he scores four out of five in everything, but then everyone else in the team, they say he scores two out of five. We have a problem in, in communication most probably. And if we don't have in communication, but then we do have a problem in self-awareness, which will lead to having a problem with communication. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. And that, that's a good idea, actually. A 360 degree feedback. Just, just curious. And uh, if you uh, if you don't want to answer, it's okay. What if uh, we're not in a... What if a person himself or herself want to understand how better they are at communication and they don't want to go with all the managers and others, you know, they just want to know about themselves. What do you reckon from them? What do you think they should do? Well, something that I also do with clients is when they ask me questions like that is, have you ever asked your friends? But ask them for real and actually listen what they're going to tell you. Go and say, no judgment. I won't be, uh, I won't misunderstand anything. Just tell me, do you think that I'm a good communicator? What do you think I could fix? Why do you think I'm doing wrong? Why do you think I could do better? And you will be surprised because people around us have so many opinions. <laughs> so many opinions. They just don't share it because we might not leave them the room to share it or because they might be introvert and they don't feel comfortable sharing or they might sense that it might bring up a confrontation. But if you actually create a safe space and initiate this conversation, you will definitely receive a very, very interesting feedback. All right. So that, that's fair. So if you're part of an organization and if you're into leadership role or something, you can try the 360 degree feedback. 
uh, and I, I completely agree. I mean, that helps. I've done it a couple of times, and it's quite eye opener. And if you just want to know yourself, you always have your friends, your good colleagues as well that you can, you know. Go by the way, if you don't have any friends to ask, by the way, if you don't have any friends to ask, and if you don't have no colleagues to ask, then for sure you have an issue with communication. <laughs> you don't need to lose sense of that. That speaks for itself. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a benchmark. We can start with that. Actually, yeah, yeah. now <laughs> we have a benchmark. Finally, no, no, that, that's that's fair. That's fair. Absolutely fair. Fantastic. Do you have any recommendations when it comes to books, videos, YouTube videos, articles, podcasts, other than mine, uh, where people can actually go and learn and read more about not just communication, but now in your case, basically, how to build a better culture and what do you look from cultural perspective from organizations? Well, one podcast I can recommend is called Sense and Signal. It's a new podcast, but uh, the guys doing it, Dan and Joda, they're very, very interesting. They have very good chemistry. And what I really like about them is that they research a lot each of the topics that they present in the podcast. They're also bringing guests upon, so I can recommend that. And then when we're talking about books, since we already started our discussion with negotiations and communication, uh, I can't but uh, promote the book of Arthur Schopenhauer, uh, The Art of Always Being Right. This is a guide to the most manipulative negotiation techniques out there. And of course, I don't recommend this book as a guide, but I do recommend it in the sense that it, it's very important to be able to recognize this kind of tactics when somebody is using them uh, against you and be able to say, OK, yeah, that's passive aggressive or that's manipulating and I will create boundaries here. Therefore, I think that it's a very important book for everyone in business, but also in life. Great. So uh, just to confirm, and I'm just wrote here. So sense a signal. That's a podcast. And, right? and signal. Yeah. Sense, sense and signal. And, and signal. All right. Sense and Perfect, signal. So yeah. I'm going to post that link there. And you mentioned how to be, how to get, no, what was the book? The Art of Always Being Right by Arthur. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And you will find right. it also uh, featured in my article on LinkedIn about uh, Oh, fantastic. 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 Now, there's a couple of articles. Um, I don't know. It's written in HR professional. I think that's uh, HR, H-R-T-R-O dot G-R. So that's, I'm, I'm not sure. It is well, journal. these kind of articles are in Greek. Uh, these are articles that are written in a Greek yeah. magazine. But if you want to read more of my articles, I have written several articles in global magazines. Therefore, if you check my website, you will find uh, all of my articles, my podcast appearances, television appearances, radio, everything basically I upload there. Fantastic, fantastic. So what I'm gonna do is, and this is for all the viewers, I'm gonna paste all the links. Okay, I'm just gonna connect. So I'll just ping you one more time just to make sure that I have all the information. And I'll paste it there so that not only you should connect with her, you should also go and read these articles. Okay, uh, listen to other podcasts that she has been to and on the television and know what exactly she's talking about because you need to, as you know, post COVID now specifically, it's very, very important to understand how the global world works as well. And you know, when you have a person whose specialization in culture, I'm pretty sure you'll learn a lot of things like what I did today. And of course you did as well. Uh, we also benchmarked the communication by the way today. <laughs> so, so over to you uh, for any last words for the viewers. Uh, well, I will have to close this podcast with uh how I started it and I'll just say once again that everything is a negotiation don't take anything for granted and just keep in mind that no one will give you something unless you very very verbally ask for it interesting just like what her client did always number three she moved on to number four and five and the world changed for her fantastic fantastic thank She's, you very if, much if, if Alexandra by the way if Alexandra in Poland listening to this podcast make it easy I will always love you <laughs> oh, all right there you go so thank you once again, Zoe, from a lovely place, Greece. Uh, it's the first time I'm ever doing podcast, first guest from, from me as well. So thank you very much for your time and uh, all the knowledge and uh, you know information that you shared. And for all the viewers, make sure to click on the links, connect with her, go and read the articles. And I'm going to share the link of the podcast and the book that you mentioned as well. Thank you.